Um, so thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Obviously the last talk to round up the, the conference. So I'm really excited to be able to speak to you uh, today. As Rory said, I'm based in South Wales, a bit of a trek to come up to North, North Wales. So it's nice to be able to kind of get to you virtually um, from, my, from my study at home uh, this evening. Um, so uh, as, as Rory said, um, my name is Liam Moulds and I'm an entomologist. Um, and my particular area of interest and expertise, I suppose, um, is in colliery spoil habitats. So I'm going to be talking a bit about colliery spoil habitats, why it's really important. And I do this work um, as part of a conservation initiative that I founded back about five years ago, uh, five years ago called the Colliery Spoil Biodiversity Initiative. Uh, and I've just got a website and I'm on Facebook and Twitter and other things as well, if any of you were interested in finding more information or following me. Um, on my little journeys. Uh, and I just, just as a bit of a disclaimer, just to say that unless otherwise stated, all the images uh, are my own as well. So I know the very really of the talk is to just introduce the term uh, colliery spoil for those that are unfamiliar with it. Um, I'm just going to give you a bit of a guided tour then about the brief history of uh, mining in the South Wales coal field and how the, the landscape has changed as a result of that. Uh, then going to just talk to you about what makes these sites particularly valuable for the wildlife, have a look at the habitats that are now found on them, a little bit more um, about the work that I've been doing, um, and then I'm going to guide you through uh, some of the invertebrates, because uh, that's my area of interest more than anything. Um, and then we'll just talk about some of the threats facing these sites and why we really should be doing more to conserve them, and then we'll have our time uh, for questions at the end as well. So colliery spoil is the, the waste material that's been left over from coal extraction. So many regions of the British Isles have quite a long history of um, deep coal mining, particularly South Wales, but also parts of North Wales, uh, Yorkshire, Central Belt of Scotland and so forth. Um, and during the extraction process, like when they're going down to get the coal, they brought up a lot of other material and a lot of this was, was waste rock. Um, and this was generally tipped within the landscape then um, to form these, well, what we call coal tips or spoil tips. And these contain um, a variety of different things, so various sedimentary rocks, particularly um, shale and ironstone, also fragments of coal of various sizes, various materials from demolished buildings, uh, particularly when they demolished um, old collieries, you'd have things like concrete and brick uh, thrown in as well. And then other waste materials as well, so things like old dram carts, um, the rails that they used to go on, or the, the ropeways that used to pull them up the, the hillsides and that sort of thing. So they're sort of almost historical uh, dumping grounds for a lot of uh, waste rock and other materials. Um, but they're quite numerous, uh, particularly in South Wales. So there's an estimated 1,200 of these sites um, in South Wales alone. Uh, and when you sort of um, add up then all of the sites and in the other coal fields in the British Isles is quite a, quite a large sort of land area that they cover. And in terms of um, the history um, of coal mining in South Wales, uh, um, as be uh, Britain began to industrialise itself, there was a huge demand um, for coal because it was needed to produce uh, the steam power upon which industry depended. So it brought about this huge boom um, in the South Wales coal industry. And then at its peak then, which is around sort of 1913, um, it employed about 232,000 men, women and children and 620 coal mines across South Wales. So a really big employer, um, as it would be in places like North East Wales as well. And with all of this work, it meant um, that it was a huge influx of people from um, across the UK and elsewhere. And so particularly from rural parts of Wales, some places like Ceredigion and West Wales, um, but also um, places like the southwest of England, so particularly uh, Cornwall from the copper and tin mines, and the old Bristolian mo uh, miners as well, and Forest of Dean miners elsewhere in England, as well as Scotland and Ireland. And then further afield like France, uh, Spain, Russia, um, Italy, just to name a few um, other countries as well. And with all this um, huge influx of, of people um, coming in, it's obviously brought huge environmental changes. And between um, 1851 uh, and 1911, um, an estimated 366,000 people moved into the South Wales coalfield. Um, and interestingly, at this time, South Wales uh, was absorbing um, immigrants at a faster rate than anywhere else in the world, apart from the United States. So with all these people, um, obviously brought very dramatic changes. Um, and the Rhondda Valleys um, really sort of uh, demonstrate the changes in the landscape in quite a short space of time. The Rhondda Valleys are probably the most famous of all the sort of South Wales mining valleys uh, and arguably um, even the, of all the mining valleys in, in Britain as well. 
Um, so the Ronda is um, just two valleys. We have the Ronda, the Ronda Var and the Ronda Vach. Um, so the, the, two, the, the two bigger and the larger. Um, and around sort of the 1850s, the population was only around 2000, was largely uh, rural, sort of agricultural, uh, and a lot of woodland as well. And then the coal industry started to take off. Um, by about the 1870s and stuff, it was around like 3000. So it's starting to climb. But as you can see uh, from this old OS map here, um, you know, there's very little going on in this part of the Ronda. Um, and if you look uh, very carefully at, at the Ronda Vach, the, the valley on the right there, you've got some really nice bands um, of what would have been sort of sessile oak woodland sort of extending right the way up the valley. So these would have been picturesque, very attractive, um, untouched uh, landscapes. And if you just kind of keep a, a close eye um, on that block of woodland on your right there, you sort of jump forward to around the time of the, the Second World War, you can see that woodland is almost entirely gone. Um, you can see how, how much the population expanded. So by 1911, the population had gone from that sort of 2,000 figure uh, or 3,000 figure right way through to uh, over 150,000. So you've got all the terraced housing, uh, you've got the, the railway lines, the diversion of the watercourses, um, lots of dramatic changes um, that have been hugely damaging uh, to the environment. And you can see the telltale signs of the coal industry as well in, in the, the old coal, coal tips. You can see the, the tramways, hopefully you see my pointer, but you've got the tramways heading up the back side and then you've got the, the large sort of spoil tips as well uh, that are formed. And these spoil tips have become a really um, iconic feature within the landscape of the South Wales Valleys. And this spoil was often discarded on the mountain tops um, and the valley sides and you get quite visually spectacular sites. Um, like the Three Pyramids of Slambradach, um, just north of Caffili. Uh, it's one of uh, several other um, examples of quite dramatic looking uh, tips in South Wales. And the vast majority of them were removed following the Aber Van disaster of, of 1966, of which the anniversary, uh, 54th anniversary was yesterday. Um, so for safety reasons, a lot were removed, um, but a lucky few managed to survive. And over time, they've undergone a really incredible transformation from these sort of black eyesores in the landscape to these really wonderful wildlife habitats and see the reason why I'm kind of talking to you uh, this evening. And some of the habitats you get on these sites are things like the amazing wildflower rich grasslands. So I think this is probably one of the more important habitats of these colliery sites is just how flower rich they are. Um, so this scene in front of you is, is all of uh, coom tips um, near uh, Bedai. So you've got this amazing um, display of kidney vet at this time of year. Um, and then you've got the old uh, Coombe Coke works in the background as well. But yeah, amazing displays of, of flower-rich grassland. This is our same grassland from a different area at a different time of year. Um, and it's a lot of umbellifers at this time of year, things like uh, wild carrot and ragwort. Uh, and this, this grassland in particular goes through this amazing change. Uh, it's flowering right way through from sort of April to October. Um, and it just goes, yeah, all the way from, yeah, sort of early things. And then you've got your kidney vetch and then you've got your umbellifers later in the season. And it's just amazing, but they're really important um, grasslands for pollinating insects. This is another um, sort of typical grassland of colliery sites. So this is um, just a lot of uh, common birds for trefoil, which tends to be one of the more abundant uh, plants on these colliery sites. And is really important plant to a number of the uh, rather special um, butterflies that are found on these sites. Yes, yeah, some nice heathland habitats as well. So particularly on those fall tips that are situated at high altitude on the on the valley tops to so get lovely dry heathland habitats with a bit of dry grassland in between. You get really impressive um, lichen heath communities, uh, which I don't really tend to see them anywhere else really in South Wales other than kind of on these cold tips, but they're really well known for their lichen heath communities. So the nice open conditions, the lack of competition means even these lichens really thrive. So you get these really impressive Cladonia lichens, um, as you've got pictured here, the nice big white uh, fluffy ones. Another nice uh, heathland, uh, this one guestly tipped um, in the Ronda. You also get a variety of wetland habitats as well. Uh, so this is might not look much, but it's just a little bit of a boggy pool and you've got sphagnum growing here, so it's kind of showing um, how they almost replicate in um, peat bog habitats, uh, which is another kind of important habitat in its own right. And you've got a lovely display of cotton grasses, um, which as many of you will know, is typically a plant that you find on peatland habitat. So they have this amazing ability to, to replicate uh, peatlands uh, as well, which is really nice. You get various water bodies, so they can be anything from seasonal pools to ponds, 
or right the way up to entire um, lakes uh, in the case of this or in rather exceptional circumstances, you can get entire reed beds as well. So this is a really impressive um, reed bed on that same site uh, near Beda. Um, and it happens to be the largest uh, reed bed within Ronda Cannon Taft. So it's uh, important that it's county level as well. Um, and as you can imagine, this is uh, particularly important for um, aquatic invertebrates, uh, but also for birds as well, things like water rail. Um, and you've also got starlings that roost there, um, a reed bunting, a reed warble, and that sort of thing as well. Uh, probably the most uh, interesting habitat and the rarest habitats that are found on these sites are these um, calcareous seepages or tufa springs. So this is where uh, water that's rich in um, calcium uh, leaches out the side of the tip and it deposits the calcium as calcium carbonate or what we call tufa. And then you get these specialist um, mosses that live around these tufa springs. And then within these mosses live um, some rather specialist uh, soldier flies, which I'm going to come on to um, a bit later on. But what should be a rather acidic uh, cold field ends up supporting these very calcareous habitats, which is really kind of unique thing about these colliery sites. Um, and probably um, a habitat that's home to some of our rarer species. So there's quite a bit of work that I've got to do now to, to look at some of the more specialist um, and rare species associated with these tufa springs. Uh, you also get woodland. Um, so some sites have got barely any trees at all, um, and then others can be quite heavily wooded usually with birch woodland, but it can be uh, willow and other things as well. And of course, bare ground, which is a habitat that's really um, undervalued, but really important um, to the biodiversity of these colliery sites, uh, particularly as nesting areas for things like solitary bees and solitary wasps, um, and as hunting areas for things like spiders and ground beetles as well. So what makes these sites particularly um, important is their diversity. So they're really varied in terms of their topography and the different aspects um, that they got. Uh, the actual spoil itself can vary quite, quite widely across a single site in terms of its composition. So it can be quite fine um, or it can be very coarse and it can contain various materials mixed in as well. Uh, the, the hydrology can vary quite a lot. Um, so where the spoil is compacted, you get some nice wetland habitats developing or where it's free draining, you'll get your heathlands and your grasslands developing. The pH, as you've seen, goes from rather acidic um, sort of peat bog uh, replicated habitats right away through to these tufa springs uh, and then varying levels of disturbance as well. So some sites are regularly used by off-road motorcyclists, whereas others might not be. Um, and all these factors combined to form these really complex habitat mosaics. Um, and importantly, these habitats are within close proximity to one another. So it's ideal, particularly for invertebrates, because many of them require uh, two or more habitats to complete their life cycle. So it means that a single invertebrate can complete its entire life cycle um, on, on these sites because it has all the different habitats that it needs. Uh, they're also really important because they're relatively undisturbed. So apart from off-road motorcyclists, that's about as far as it generally goes. Uh, so they haven't got uh, all the issues with um, uh, fertilizers and pesticides and, and that sort of thing to deal with, or just the general interference of man when it comes to um, mowing of grasslands and that sort of thing. So they're relatively undisturbed, so they're, they're almost more undisturbed than nature reserves because you haven't got all the influence of dog walkers and other things as well. Um, and they've got these really nutrient poor soils, um, which really encourages the biodiversity on these sites. So it ensures that the sites remain in this early successional state. They remain open um, and also the, the stress ground conditions encourage uh, the plants to produce more flowers. So they tend to be more flower rich uh, than they would naturally as well. So there's a number of these factors acting to make these sites particularly valuable um, for, for wildlife. Uh, and the, the reason I kind of got back got into uh, my research was uh, back in January 2015, I started on um, a traineeship scheme called the Natural Talent Traineeship Scheme, uh, which is run by the conservation volunteers and funded by the Esme Fairbound Foundation. And it was a scheme that was set up because um, they realized that there was a skill shortage in the conservation sector regarding certain taxonomic groups and one of those was invertebrates. Um, so I, I spent my time with the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff um, and as part of that um, I was at a research project and I was based in the entomology department and I was, went out and started surveying uh, old colliery sites within my home county of Ronda and Taff. Uh, and I think the museum um, chose um, these sort of habitats because it's sort of seen as quite an iconic uh, Welsh habitat uh, particularly within South Wales. And rather little was known about these sites in terms of the invertebrate uh, communities um, and generally just very little about the whole wildlife on these sites as well. So it was a, it was a nice sort of area to get into. 
So I've done that for just over a year and the results are really promising um, and we found that they are actually valuable sites. Um, and then really grateful then to Rhonda and Taft Council who kindly funded me for two years to continue their work in, in that county. Um, and then my neighbouring county of, of uh, Neath Talbot as well, also funded me for two years. And uh, I've been lucky enough to work with Regen Council as well this year to start looking at some of their sites as well. So um, in terms of like the initial results from, from the initial sites I looked at, it recorded just over 900 species, um, which any entomologist among you will know that it's not a particularly uh, impressive figure. Um, but it's just important to note that um, I started with no background in entomology at all, so kind of went out um, straight away. So there's definitely room for massive improvements in a lot of groups. Um, and there's no really, any, well, there's no group really other than probably the bees that have been really well covered. And because the bees happen to be my main area of interest. So there's definitely room to, to add more. Um, and these figures are much outdated now, probably by near enough two years. Um, but it just gives you an idea that there's a, a quite an impressive diversity um, of species found on these sites. Um, but perhaps a really key thing is that about 20% um, of all invertebrates I've recorded on these sites are species of conservation priority um, at a UK level. So it does show that they're, they're sort of um, important sites for conserving some of our sort of rarest and most threatened species within Wales as well. And I'm just going to kind of go through some of my favourite species or some of the species I think are particularly interesting um, and just kind of, yeah, hopefully it'll be something of interest uh, to all of you. So starting with the, with the butterflies, so I've recorded 28 butterfly species on the sites that I looked at so far. Um, lots of the common ones as you'd expect, but some of the more specialist ones are things like the dingy skipper, uh, which is a really beautiful butterfly that, which I think it probably doesn't quite live up to his name. I think dingy is a bit, bit harsh because they're really attractive little things, very moth-like butterflies. Um, and these uh, feed on common birds for trefoil, so a very common plant, but the difference is that this butterfly needs that common birds for trefoil next to where it's a bare ground, so it needs the higher temperatures that that that, that the bare ground provides for its larval development. So it really loves brownfield sites, particularly these colliery sites, because you've got the birds of trefoil growing next to areas of black spoils. You've got high high temperatures, um, which really favours the caterpillars, which is really nice. And this is a species that's undergone a widespread decline in the UK, and it's considered a priority species for conservation as well. Another one um, is a grayling butterfly, another one that needs areas of bare ground. Um, and this species is another priority species at the UK level, undergone a widespread decline. Um, but the South Wales Valleys are one of his UK strongholds and he absolutely loves the colliery sites. Um, and some of the sites where the, the biggest populations of grayling in South Wales are old uh, spoil tips. Uh, but they got this amazing mottled hindwing and they'll, they'll tuck their orangey yellow forewing under the hindwing. Uh, when they're basking on bare ground and they almost disappear. They're really amazing things um, and quite large butterflies as well. Um, on a few sites you get small blue butterfly, um, which I'm sure many of you know is quite a rare butterfly within Wales, or particularly is in South Wales. It's known from a, a few coastal sites um, and an inland relatively few sites, but it is found on a few colliery sites, uh, particularly within Rondekin and Taff, uh, where they feed on uh, kidney vetch. So you've seen the grassland earlier with lots and lots of kidney vetch. This is our smallest UK um, resident butterfly. Also some lovely fritillaries as well. So the small to the border fritillary, which is another UK um, biodiversity action plant species, another priority species. Uh, this really likes the marshy areas on, on these colliery sites where you've got the violets growing, which is its larval food plants. You also get quite a number of dark green fritillaries, which are, are not so scarce, um, but they're still lovely things to see. And another ones that are feeding on those violets. Also get things like marbled whites, particularly within the Eastern Valleys, within the Gwent Valleys. Uh, they do particularly well for marbled whites, um, not so much within um, the area I'm in around the kind of tap, but a really beautiful um, butterfly that is quite common in England, but we don't see it uh, too much within Wales. Um, in terms of moths, I haven't really done much on moths at all. I've done a few day flying moths, um, but that's been about it. Uh, but I've included uh, this moth just because the caterpillar is just so beautiful. A beautiful yellow underwing um, and its caterpillars feed on uh, heathers and it tends to be probably the most common moth that I see when I'm out doing my uh, survey work. Um, probably one of the more notable moths um, associated with the colliery sites is the forester moth which is quite a rare moth within um, Glamorgan at least um, and it's, it's found on a few colliery sites and particularly this year it's done quite well on a site um, just north of Cardiff which is really good. 
Uh, but the real sort of flagship um, moth, the one that I most commonly see uh, when I'm out and about um, in the day, on a nice warm summer day, is the six belted clearwing, which uh, was a nationally scarce species, but is um, sort of lost its status now, but it's still a pretty uncommon species within South Wales. And this feeds on common birds, so trefoil, so you can see the value of that plant for a number of uh, different species. And it's just lovely to see these flying around on, on warm summer's days. Um, I've mentioned earlier that bees are kind of my main area um, of interest. So these have probably been covered better than anything else really um, so far. And I've recorded um, just over 90 species now, so that figure is a bit outdated. So, but it's quite an impressive figure because um, that equates to about a third of the UK fauna, about half of our, our Welsh bee fauna as well. So not bad, for just a couple of sites uh, within the, the middle of the South Wales coalfield. Um, and perhaps most importantly, this includes a number of rather uncommon species, so our localised scarce, our rare and red dated book um, species. And some of the best colliery sites can support um, sort of in excess of 50 or 60 different species. And I'm sure with more survey effort, you would get that figure uh, way up as well. But quite ironically, um, most of these species are mining bees, so there is still mining going on in the South Wales Valleys. Um, it would be good, please, to know. Um, and so 28 um, of the species I've recorded, um, I think it's more about 29 or 30 now, um, are mining bees, so ground nesting solitary bees, um, but also a variety of other solitary bees as well, so things like nomad bees and furrow bees um, and blood bees and leaf cutter bees and so forth, um, but also a good diversity of bumblebees as well. So 15 species of bumblebee, which isn't too bad out of the 24 UK species that we got, um, and of course the one honey bee is only the one species across the whole of Europe. Some of the species include things like Andrina coitana, which is a small flecked mining bee, which is a very localised species that's found across the UK. Um, and it's really nice one to have because there's relatively few sites for it uh, within Wales. Um, and the males have got this wonderful yellow little face, which relatively few uh, male mining bees have these yellow faces. So, so that's nice to see. And it's a species that really likes these yellow asteraceae, so things like hawk's beards and hawk bits and cat's ear and those sort of plants. Um, another species that does particularly well is the Catia mining bee, which is a, a nationally scarce species, so it's another good one to have. Um, as the name suggests, it forages, forages on Catia, um, and this is the female. Probably uh, the more sort of flagship um, solitary bee really on these sites is the Tormental mining bee. So this is found on a number of um, different sites, um, and it's a, it's a priority species for conservation again because it's undergone a really widespread decline. So it's been lost from about 50% of its known sites since 1970. Um, and its name suggests it, it forages largely on uh, Tormentil. In terms of the bumblebees, um, we get really good populations of brown banded carder bee in South Wales. So you can relatively commonly see brown banded carders on these colliery sites and they really love the legumes, so a lot of the kidney vetch and, and your birds with trefoils and those sort of plants. Um, but probably my favourite bumblebee of all, and the one that I really love seeing, is the bilberry bumblebee, um, or what we might call winberry bumblebee down here. Uh, but it's got this amazing um, orange tail that extends most of the way up the abdomen. It's a really beautiful thing, uh, with its yellow bands as well behind the neck and that sort of thing. But a really stunning thing and sort of a high altitude species. Um, and I'm sure many of you would have seen this around Snowdonia and other places up in North Wales, but it's a really, really stunning looking species. Um, in terms of moth, um, in terms of wasps, this is probably the, the main sort of standout species that I tend to see. It's not so much because it's a scarce, it's not, not particularly scarce, it's rather localised though, um, but just because of its size, it's quite a large species, um, it's quite um, distinctive and quite elongate, um, and it hunts a lot of those caterpillars that I've shown um, earlier, so things like the beautiful yellow underwing um, and the caterpillars of true lovers knot and a lot of those heathland um, associated moths, but these are quite impressive things to see on summer's day, hunting caterpillars and um, bury them alive. In terms of beetles, um, you struggle not to see a green tiger beetle on these colliery sites, so they really love um, the open bare ground, uh, they like the, the high temperatures, the dry conditions, and as you can see they've got large eyes and large jaws, so they're really visual predators, so they're using the bare ground in order to hunt for uh, things like spiders and ants, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but their larvae also need the areas of bare ground. So their larvae are quite wacky looking things. They've got these circular heads and they sit, sit within these uh, circular burrows in the bare, bare spoil. Uh, and then they sort of 
wait and act as a bit of a pitfall trap and spiders and ants will fall down into the into the little trap and, and these things will eat them but they're absolutely um, amazing little things. Um, one of the more uh, standout species uh, is the bee beetle. So I've seen this quite a few times when going out doing survey work on these uh, spall tips and as you can see it gets its name from its sort of like furry um, body which is almost um, bee-like um, and also the pattern which is almost bee-like if you sort of really squint. Um, but these are relatively uncommon beetles um, found largely in the west of Britain uh, but they develop in birch um, and again birch tends to be the, one of the more common trees on these colliery sites as well. We get some lovely pot beetles as well so particularly this species which is Cryptocephalus aureola so you get this lovely uh, metallic green coloration you find these in sort of yellow asteraceae plants again. All beetles have been quite an interesting revelation in the last few years so been finding um, violet oil beetles on these sites for the for the very first time as this individual is um, and but also this year black oil beetle as well so it's perhaps no surprise given that how good the bee populations are on these sites that the, the oil beetles which are um, cuckoos or they sort of develop within the nest of solitary bees it's no surprise that they're turning up as well but these are priority species for conservation as well so it's really nice to have these oil beetles on on these sites you also get other sort of bee associates as well, so things like bee flies, so as well as the common dark edge bee fly that you might see um, quite commonly in your garden. We also get a western bee fly, which is a, a nasty scarce species, and as the name suggests, largely found in the west of Britain. Um, and it's a very small species, so this is one picture this year on my thumb. Um, I am got the biggest fingers in the world and you can see just how small uh, it is, so it's really easily overlooked. Get some lovely hoverflies as well, so things like Microdon, which are my favourite hoverfly group. Sort of um, rather dumpy little hoverflies. This is a, a mating pair photograph this year. Um, and these develop within the, the nests of ants, um, particularly red ants, um, and hence the mermicky part of their name. Um, but yeah, really nice things. Um, they, they're only identifiable based on, the, on their larvae, uh, so you have to find the larvae to try to find them and you can't the adults, it's a bit of a shame, but a really interesting um, little hob flies. So I mentioned the tupa springs earlier, um, so this is one of the specialist um, flies that you get um, associated with those tufa springs, so this is Oxycera pygmaea or the pygmy soldier fly, so a very small species, hence the image is a little bit grainy. Uh, these are only perhaps up to about three or four millimeters um, in length, but you can see a female here um, egg laying directly into the tufa and this is a relatively uncommon species and particularly quite scarce within South Wales. So it's really nice to get uh, these little soldier flies um, around these tufa springs. And another one that we get um, around these seepages as well is the banded general, which is a much larger soldier fly, really impressive looking thing, um, bigger than your sort of typical uh, popper fly in size, but really attractive um, yellow and black, and quite striking markings get some really nice um, snail coming flies and unfortunately more, more of the interesting species, the scarcest species I haven't got photos of. So I've included quite a common species here but just to show you kind of how attractive some of these uh, snail killing flies can be. So you've got this amazing uh, reticulate wing pack pattern with nice spots on the thorax and some nice head markings as well. But these are really interesting um, in terms of their life cycles um, and quite attractive flies as well. You also get some bigger, sort of bruisier um, flies as well, for things like the kinid flies, with big bristly things. Um, and this is the kind of grosso, which is um, Europe's largest kinid fly. It's almost bumblebee size, so it's um, or queen bumblebee size, it's pretty sizable. Um, and these are internal parasites um, of a lot of um, moths, uh, particularly moths that you find on sort of heathland habitats. But perhaps uh, one of the more prettier tachinids that you get quite commonly is tachina ursina, which is a, a species that's out in sort of March, April time and is very um, iconic of uh, springtime. So once you see these, you kind of know it's, it's definitely spring um, has arrived, but really quite attractive things and look like little um, flying uh, teddy bears. So bugs, you get some really nice bugs and some really quite scarce ones as well. Um, but this particular species is my favourite, this is Hoplomarchus stambergii, um, but it's got this, I don't know, it's got really nice colours. Um, it's only small, um, perhaps only about four millimetres, um, but you find them on uh, mouse, ear, mouse ear hawkweed, 
So it's a really common plant um, that you get on the, on the nice free draining areas, the hot, dry areas of these fall tips. Uh, and this particular species only uh, is only associated with that plant. So it's a nice one to look for um, in sort of June and July time. You get various um, grasshoppers as well, as well as all the common things and crickets as well. Uh, probably the model grasshopper is the most um, iconic, perhaps out of all of the grasshopper species you get on these sites. So this particular species is really likes the bare ground habitats and dry areas. Uh, so these would be quite vocal um, in, the, in the spring and summertime, uh, particularly on hot sunny days. You get various dragonflies as well. Uh, so particularly um, golden ring dragonfly, which um, I'm sure many people know is, is quite a common species, but it's just an impressive looking thing. And uh, it's also the UK's longest dragonfly. And they, I tend to find that they're the most docile out of all the dragonflies as well. So it tends to be the one that I can get closer to uh, or will even sort of land on me when I'm doing my survey work. So it's a dragonfly is quite close to my heart. I was quite lucky to see this individual actually um, capture and eat a, a bumblebee alive this year as well, which is really quite an interesting uh, observation to see. Probably the more notable um, of the dragonflies and damselflies on these sites is the, um, the scarce blue-tailed damselfly. So you've got a nice uh, mating pair of these here. And this is um, a priority species for conservation in the UK because it's undergone a widespread decline. But it, it quite likes the sparsely vegetated um, pools that you get on these sites. So it quite likes the, the pools that look quite rubbish to us. Um, as having kind of no vegetation, these are ideal places for the scarce blue tail damselfly. Some, some other lovely spiders, um, only featuring uh, one spider, um, but this is uh, one that I think is really stunning. Uh, so this is commonly called the cricket bat or weaver spider, because uh, if you look at his markings on his abdomen, it does superficially resemble a cricket bat, so you've got that black mark um, going up and then broadening out almost in a cricket bat shape. Uh, but this is quite an uncommon species within Wales. Um, it's been nice that they've turned this up on quite a few sites um, this year, um, particularly in areas that they hadn't been seen before as well, in Glamorgan, which has been nice. It's a really cool harvest one as well, and the more interesting one really is the Sabacon, uh, which some of you might have seen in North Wales as well. But this is a, a species that's uh, from the Pyrenees, and it first arrived or was discovered in the UK uh, from, I think it was down on the Gower in uh, 1980. And then it's since spread uh, throughout all of Wales um, and also uh, parts of England as well. But it's got these really amazing paddy palps at the front that are covered in these long sort of hairs um, that they believe that they use them to sort of mop up um, springtails or calembla. You also get some uh, really cool pseudoscorpions. So I'm sure, um, well, perhaps a lot of you haven't seen pseudoscorpions, but they're really quite cool little things. They look like scorpions, um, but, they're, but they're not because they haven't got the tail, uh, hence the name pseudoscorpion or false scorpion. But they tend to be really small little things. Um, so this particular individual, I think, is only about sort of three millimeters, um, and they can get a lot smaller as well. Um, but they're quite interesting when you see them uh, up close and magnified. Uh, and this particular species has got these nice uh, dark claws, which is quite distinctive. Uh, for this species, which is nice. Uh, millipedes is probably the area um, that revealed the more um, rarer uh, species. Uh, so one of those is um, the bed eye beast, which is found on that colliery site I mentioned um, near bed eye. Um, so it's the only site in Britain for it, but it's believed to have been um, introduced. So I believe it's from um, Portugal and, and Spain, a uh, similar sort of area to where a lot of the other things are turning up from. Um, but a rather lovely little thing. It doesn't quite live up to his name as being a beast because it's only about five to six millimeters long, so very small. Um, but it's this like translucent white color, um, and you can see the, the darker coloration on the body there is where it, that's its gut content. So it's almost translucent, which is quite interesting. But it's all there's been a number of millipedes and we found new clients from South Wales in the last few years. Uh, one of them is, is this one. Uh, so this one was found um, near a woodland um, in by Bridgend uh, back in 2017 um, and it's been found at a few other sites as well now um, but three of his four known sites worldwide all of them are in South Wales uh, but three of the four are uh, all colliery sites so that's quite interesting um, as well that it seems to be cropping up on a lot of these colliery sites. Get some really cool uh, slugs as well 
Uh, most of them are um, invasive ones or more interesting ones. Um, one of those is the ghost slug, um, which is my favorite slug of all. So you get a ghostly white color, hence the name. Um, and they're sort of subterranean, they live underground where they feed on earthworms. And they're not believed to cause any um, damage to earthworm population. This is a species that was only described um, new to science in 2008 from a Cardiff garden. Uh, but it's since been discovered uh, even up in North Wales, across South Wales and Oxford and Devon and other places as well. So it's cropping up everywhere. So it's one to really kind of keep an eye out for, but a really interesting uh, species and believed to be um, the first species to have um, a Welsh word within its scientific name as well. So that was a bit of a run through about all the wonderful species and habitats you get on these uh, former colony sites. Uh, but unfortunately, these sites um, are under threat um, and the list of different threats are quite long um, yeah, and quite extensive. Uh, but some of those include things like developments that could be for, for housing or industry, uh, inappropriate reclamation or remediation. So particularly where they're landscaping um, these nice old sites and you're kind of removing um, the complexity of them and destroying the, the habitats there. Uh, inappropriate or an absence of management. So quite often they have no management at all, which is um, good in some respects in terms of the biodiversity, but also really bad in other respects, because a lot of them are getting to a stage you now where they're scrubbing over um, and you're going to lose a lot of those um, habitat mosaics and a lot of those more interesting and rarer species as well. So they do need management, unfortunately, which they're not currently getting. Um, some of the new emerging threats are planting them up with um, crop biofuels or um, using them as an aggregate for the construction industry. Um, there's also the, the continued threat of them being removed due to the perceived um, safety risk. Um, so a lot of the remaining sites are um, actually safe. Um, they wouldn't have left them if they wasn't deemed to be safe. Um, but unfortunately, um, it's always in the public mind that um, these sites could collapse. And particularly when um, the Aberfan disaster is talked about every year on the anniversary and that brings up um, a fresh wave of public concern uh, about the safety of these sort of sites and it's going to be really hard to get away from that stigma um, of them being unsafe places and generally they are pretty safe. Um, and also from Welsh Government there's, there's been um, a lot of push in past decades to plant them up with coniferous woodlands or plantation woodland so that has evidently destroyed a lot of habitats and um, and resulted in a loss of species as well. Um, but hopefully um, they're becoming a bit more aware now to the importance of brownfield habitats and you shouldn't be uh, planting them up with uh, plantation woodland. So all of these different threats mean that they are a habitat in decline and their habitat has been um, in decline really since the 70s and 80s. Um, and even um, as our understanding of these sites really improves and we understand how important they are in terms of their biodiversity, and they are unfortunately still being lost um, and it's just that stigma associated with brownfield sites that is really really hard to shift really but these are really important sites um, um, just, um, just by example just one of the sites that's being developed on um, at the moment in South Wales is Coidili Colliery which is the one that's opposite my house because uh, I live in Coidili as well um, and this is a site that first got me interested in wildlife so it's a really wonderful site um, it's got those dingy skippers and brown banded carder bees and grayling butterflies and a lot of those priority species. Uh, but unfortunately, it's being developed uh, as an industrial estate at the moment. And it's just a continued um, battle, really, to try to, to save a lot of these sites, even though uh, they're really important. Uh, one of well, some of our most important wildlife habitats would be in South Wales. So, regardless of how well um, nature has recovered these sites, there's still often this pressure to do something uh, useful with them. Uh, so that doing something useful could be, uh, obviously could be developing them, but it could be planting woodland on them. It might even be planting oak trees on them um, and other things like that. Or it might be well-meaning um, groups wanting to plant wildflower seeds on sites that are already wildflower rich um, and other things like that. So there's constantly that, that opinion in people's mind that they need to be fixed. There's a man-made habitat though, so they're, they're not, not good for anything and we need to do something, but actually nature is has done it all on his own accord and they're actually amazing places as they already are. So what really should be seen as an ecological asset is still often viewed as a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, and that's despite these sites supporting species new to science as well. So I mentioned there's been a few millipedes that have turned up new to science um, in the last few years. Uh, one of those is the Mardi monster. 
Um, so this is a species of millipede that was found new to science from Mardi Colliery in the top of the Rhonda. Um, so this just goes to show really that, um, you know, you're finding these species that are not known anywhere else in the world. So we really, we shouldn't be losing these sites um, because, you know, they could be home to lots of other new to science species that we haven't yet discovered as well. But this particular species is almost the, the flagship species of my work really, because it helps to really demonstrate how valuable um, these sites are and how much we really need to learn about them before we destroy them effectively. Uh, but this, this millipede hit headlines across the world, which is really um, nice promotion for these colorless ball habitats. So we really should be looking to conserve these sites. Um, so they're really fantastic wildlife habitats that are unfortunately in decline. Um, they are an important refuge for rare and scarce species that are declining in the wider countryside. Um, I believe that they act as really important stepping stones in the landscape. Um, so they're allowing species to move, which is really important when it comes to climate change. Um, I think that the importance of these sites will be uh, further enhanced in years to come as a result. Um, perhaps most importantly, they help to fill the gap. So they connect up to, to more natural habitats. So if it wasn't for these sites, our natural habitats would be much more fragmented. Um, so it's almost helping uh, to sustain a lot of species and perhaps why the South Wales Valley still supports uh, a lot of species that are considered, you know, decline um, priority species elsewhere in, in the UK as well. But they, their importance goes beyond biodiversity and it goes beyond invertebrates as well. So they're really important sites, particularly fungi. So they, import, they support some of Wales' rarest fungi and some of the UK's rarest fungi as well, um, including some species in to science. Uh, really important for light guns as well as reptiles um, and amphibians as well. But beyond the biodiversity, uh, they're really valuable geologically for, um, for their access to uh, fossils and minerals. They do have archaeological importance as well for their access to um, historical structures and, and remains as well. Um, and just as landscape features on their own, they've got that um, historical value there. Um, they're really important socially as well, so as um, important areas for recreation. So you've got those um, physical and mental um, health benefits to local communities. They've also got that cultural um, and historical importance. So they help to tell a landscape story um, and they're part of our cultural identity um, as South Wales as well. And I think it's really sad in Wales that we, uh, we're not very good at preserving our industrial uh, heritage or generally our historical monuments. Um, so. As, as a lot of colliery buildings have now been removed, um, apart from the terrace housing really, is only really these fall tips um, as the last real, lasting legacy really of, of the coal industry. So I really should, think we should be considering them for our cultural identity as well, um, as their biodiversity value as well. So what does the future hold for these sites? Um, as you hopefully have seen from my talk, they are really important sites, um, really beautiful sites as well that are home to some really spectacular species. Um, but the future is really uncertain with these sites because the vast majority of them are unprotected. Um, they're not managed um, in any way. The vast majority um, are written into local development plans. A lot of the sites I feature today are within local development plans and um, have been for decades. So unfortunately, they are sites that are continually threatened. Um, and I don't really know what the future does hold from, but it's quite an uncertain future. Um, but hopefully, my work is just campaigning to make people aware about how valuable they are. Um, but hopefully um, within my lifetime, luckily I'm young enough now that hopefully um, in my lifetime, I will see some of these sites protected and designated as triple SIs um, or turned into uh, nature reserves or taken on by wildlife trusts and that sort of thing. Um, but we'll have to sort of wait and see. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, Colliery Spot is a regional resource that needs conservation and further investigation. Um, they are unique landscape features and sites of high biodiversity significance. And in my opinion, I think they deserve to be protected. If you want to find out a little bit more information, I've got a website that's very outdated, but you're welcome to, to have a look at that. Uh, but I've got quite a useful document. Um, there's a download section on the website, and this um, document that I wrote a few years ago called uh, The Invertebrate Conservation Value of Colliery Spot Habitats. That's got some really nice information. It's not actually that much about invertebrates. It does summarize some of my invertebrate work, but it's largely about the value of these sites, um, how they be managed and that sort of thing. So thank you very much for that. Um, do check me out on Twitter and Facebook if you're interested in following uh, what I'm up to and the species I encounter. Um, but feel free as well to drop me an email anytime if you have any questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much.